Hello, right, um, today I'm going to be talking about the type of film that uh, Labyrinth del Fauno um, is. Um, it's been described as lots of different things. Um, it's obviously a kind of thriller, um, it's uh, a drama, um, it's kind of set in a historical era, so there is some you know, element of being a historical drama, of course. Um, the category it probably best falls into, though, of type of film is really uh, that of a dark fantasy or of a adult fairy tale or a dark fairy tale. Um, that's in fact how Guillermo del Toro, the director, actually describes it in various interviews that he's done. Uh, interviews that are well worth looking up on uh, on YouTube, in fact, um, as a, as a dark fairy tale. So let's just look at the elements of of why this is uh, a dark fairy tale. What are those elements that del Toro has placed into the film uh, that make it that make it into such a such into into this genre particularly. Um, the first thing to bear in mind is the fact that um, as a fairy tale, it goes back to the old traditions of fairy tales, very much how the Brothers Grimm would have written how many fairy tales would have been before Walt Disney and the Hollywood film industry got their hands on them and decided to turn them into sugary pink, lovely tales that would make tiny children happy uh, without really providing the message that, that often was part of the fairy tales. In the olden days, the, the tales, when they were probably first written, they were much darker. Um, they were much grimmer. Um, you know, the big bad wolf would kill the grandmother. There was much more peril for, for Little Red Riding Hood. Hansel and Gretel, um, you know, would have, would have maybe got eaten or whatever it was in those particular stories. The, the, the Brothers Grimm and the other kind of traditional fairy tales were very dark. They often told of monsters, often told of creatures, put the kind of heroines in a lot of peril. And this was something that Del Toro, I think, has very consciously gone and tried to do to kind of put the fairy tale back uh, into that kind of dark category. It's not a Disney film. It's not a Hollywood film. Um, it does have darkness. It does have violence. It does have peril. Um, it does... Uh, it does kind of set out to to scare and and really, you know, put the the protagonist into into danger. So that's the first thing to say, right? In terms of fairy tale um, constructs, there are lots of things within the plot within the film that that very much set the scene as being a fairy tale. The very first thing is is ha is the narrator's the narrator's voice. Um, after we've had the intro, we kind of find out when the film is set. We see Ophelia um, lying on the ground with blood retreating into her nose, and then we the camera goes through her eye, and then we hear the narrator telling the story of the underground kingdom and the princess who dreamt of seeing the human world and one day escaping, and so on. Now, the language used in this is very much like a fairy tale. It does put us, the, the spectator right into the mood of it being a fairy tale, as if we had a cup of hot chocolate there and were, you know, kind of had our, our favourite grandfather or someone sitting by our bed reading it to us. So we're put in that mode by, by the very language used by the narrator in this case. Um, so we're kind of anticipating... Um, if you like, a fairy tale leaning. There is a fairy tale tale that is led, there's left to be completed. Um, so that's how he sets the scene straight away. Um, the second thing to kind of talk about is that um, the the characters within the film are very much like uh, characters that are stereotypical or that at least will be very familiar to us from fairy tales. We have Ophelia, the young heroine, the young girl. The princess, if you, as well. Uh, we have the kind of uh, the evil monster. In this case, it's a very human monster, Vidal. Vidal also takes the part of the evil stepfather, another very common stereotype uh, of the fairy tale, who kind of uh, cruelly impacts on the rather weak and sickly mother. Um, again, that's a very common character in a fairy tale, the, the character that Carmen plays. You could say that Mercedes really plays a part of the fairy godmother. She is the motherly figure who, you know, comes and helps Ophelia whenever she can. She provides the love and care that Ophelia um, doesn't really have. So in many ways you could say that Mercedes is a fairy godmother-like figure. Uh, you quite often have the repressed villagers, the, the villagers that are struggling under the yoke of the of the evil king or the ogre. In this case, this would probably be Pedro and the other rebeldes uh, who, were, who are fighting in the forest. Dr. Ferreiro is probably 
the kind of the tragic hero, um, the person who who often has to die so that the the cause of good is is almost strengthened. So you're almost um, almost the situation seems more hopeless. And Ferreiro probably does um, does carry out that role. And you have the character of the guide in this case, the mysterious fawn. Um, so these are all creatures that you would associate with the traditional fairy tale. And of course you've got the monsters themselves. No fairy tale would be complete without some kind of monster, whether it's a, a, an ogre, a dwarf, something like that. In this case we have the pale man, very much a kind of man-eating ogre type figure, um, and the giant frog. Um, again, quite often the monsters were creatures from the natural environment, for example the big bad wolf, the three bears, and so on and so forth. These are all characters that not only the audience would be familiar with, but probably more importantly too, Ophelia would be, would be familiar with. After all, you know, given the fact that we're not sure if all the tasks are real or not, um, Ophelia therefore would be creating them through her, own, through her own imagination, an imagination inspired by the amount of fairy tale stories that we know she reads from the very start of the film, where Carmen, her mother in the car, says to her, you know, aren't you too old to be reading these fairy tales? You know, so the fairy tale characters that we see are, are very familiar to us and obviously to Ophelia, who may well have created them as well. So, so that's the second kind of key element to, um, to, to the kind of fairy tale, the dark fairy tale type of genre that we're in. Um, if we deal with Ophelia as a heroine, she's a very typical uh, fairy tale story heroine. Um, there's many other young ladies who are kind of on the threshold of of being coming a, 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 a kind of young lady who are going through the kind of uh, the period from childhood to adolescence. You only have to think of Goldilocks, Little Red Riding Hood, Alice in Wonderland, Dorothy um, in The Wizard of Oz. Now, the Guillermo del Toro deliberately makes Ophelia a very uh, a very sympathetic character, but but he also makes a a girl because it, it creates a greater contrast between her and the antagonist, in this case Fidel. The dramatic tension is really heightened by the fact that Ophelia can only rely on her wits, her intelligence, her bravery, her, her, moral, um, her moral rules that govern her, the way she acts. She can't outfight Vidal. The situation is hopeless. Much as in every other case, the heroine is often faced by a creature that can't be beaten through strength alone. Um, it would be much less satisfying as a viewer if this dramatic tension wasn't there. The fact that the task seems impossible, that she has to commit these tasks and then fight against Vidal the whole time. It, it really works well to have this kind of character. Um, it's almost strengthening the message of the film that... that Strength isn't enough. You have to have greater ingenuity. You have to have greater faith and morality to to win the struggle um, and to beat the evil that is kind of encompassing the the kingdom of Spain or the realm of Spain or even the uh, the underground kingdom, as it may be. So that's another aspect: the fact that the character is is one we're we're familiar with, and there are certain little little moments. For example, the dress that Ophelia wears as she is. Uh, that she's given by Carmen before the dinner that she then takes off before um, going into the tree to defeat the frog. Um, it's, very sim it's very similar to, for example, Alice uh, in Wonderland. Um, Alice often obviously goes through a kind of a tunnel herself, the rabbit hole. So there's a kind of similarity there. Another example of a kind of leaning with another very famous, fa uh, fairy, famous fairy tale is the red shoes right at the end when Ophelia... Um, has is told that she's she's passed the final test. We see her in a lovely dress, and the camera looks at the two red shoes. Very, very symbol, very, very um, easily comparable to the red shoes that Dorothy wears in The Wizard of Oz. So I think Del Toro has definitely um, borrowed from the traditional fairy tale to create Ophelia, his character, and, and certainly I think the film would lose a lot of resonance, resonance, sorry, if the character was a young man. Um, a young girl uh, makes the message stronger and you also have the battle of sexes as well which, which is something we can talk about in future uh, talks um, other kind of aspects of the, the traditional fairy tale that we see are, are kind of um, things like magic books things like the fairies uh, things like the chalk that opens doors 
um, a magic plant that somehow conveys some kind of gift. Um, these are all not only things from fairy tales, but often things from legend as well. Uh, the mandrake root particularly um, is, a, is, a, is a creature of legend. Um, the idea that this plant um, that dreamt of being human um, is something that was believed in, in lots of myths and legends of the, of the Middle Ages and, and later. Um, in fact, one of the legends was that, that anyone who would hear the scream of the mandrake would die. Um, in this case, the three people who would hear it, Ophelia, Carmen and Vidal, all die uh, within the film. Uh, so obviously there is a, a little bit of, of resonance with that particular symbol as well. The magic book, again, there's lots of magic books within, within traditional fairy tales. Um, all these magical elements combine to really set the scene. Um, another idea that's very characteristic of the fairy tale is the law of three. Um, we often have you know three bears, three wise men... Um, three tasks to perform. And in this film, there are lots of examples of this. We've obviously got the three tasks that Ophelia has to overcome, go through to prove herself worthy of becoming princess again. Um, we have the three fairies. We have the three doors in the, uh, the domain of the pale man, which she has to choose which one to open. There are three amber stones that she feeds the, um, the frog in the first task. Uh, there are three thrones at the end. Um, one for her the one she's earned, and one for her father and one for her mother. Um, we also have the, the, uh, the challenge of Vidal to the stutterer. Cuenta tres. Can you count to three? Uh, so again, that kind of law of three, a very common um, fairy tale um, element, is very much present. Um, quite often the fairy tale um, was, would show a rite of passage. Um, it would show a young, a young person, a prince, a princess, a young boy, a young girl, having to overcome some form of test to gain adulthood, to go through the path to great, great, gain a claim. And again, this is very much the case with Ophelia in this case. The, the task that she has to perform will lead her to become a princess. Symbolically, the task she has to perform, the, the struggle she will have to overcome, will often bring salvation to the kingdom of Spain, the nation of Spain. Um, the idea of bringing peace and prosperity back to a kingdom isn't just with the underground kingdom in this case, but also symbolically it's the same with Spain as well. Um, and probably the, the final element of the of the fairy tale that's present within this film, or the one, the final one that I'm going to mention today, is that... The fairy tales would have a moral. The original point of having a fairy tale was to provide some kind of life lesson to people. Uh, whether it's, you know, um, don't be tempted, uh, don't believe things that are told to you by strangers, um, don't go into woods on your own, these kind of basic things. In this case, the moral is, is a, bit more, a bit more strong than that. It's a bit stronger than that, really. We've got the moral of the fact that obedience without questioning is, is, is wrong when faced by evil. It's the importance of using your moral judgment to fight for what you believe in. Um, and that's a message that is very much passed on by Dr. Ferreiro um, shortly before he is shot by Vidal. The unquestioning obedience is only something that Vidal can understand. The message that Ferreiro gives is saying, it is not enough for... For evil to triumph, it is enough that good men do nothing, if you like. You have to follow your morals, think properly, and only, it's only through this way that you will you will achieve something great. So that moral message is possibly the final element of, of this very fairy tale. A fairy tale that is a dark one, there is a lot more violence than, than uh, viewers would be accustomed to in traditional American, Disney, Hollywood films. But as I said at the beginning, Del Toro with, with this film is, is very much putting the fairy tale back into its traditional place with its dark, rather gloomy, um, scary side. And in my view, he does this extremely well. <laughs>